who betrays Jesus in his last week on earth? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 26. All right. So Jesus is coming towards the end of his ministry, and that means the end of his life. This is the time we're in when I'm reading this podcast. It is coming close to our time on this planet now, and it's coming time for Jesus. And the plot that they have against him is coming to a close as well. So it says that Jesus finished saying all the things he just said. He gave us parables about the wise and unwise virgins. Then he gave us parables about the talent and using talent to increase talent and make it more. And to those who do that, more will be given. He says, you know, two days, Passover is coming, and Jesus, the Son of Man, will be delivered to be crucified. He is telling his people this is going to happen. The chief priests were plotting against him. They were gathered in the palace, it says, and Caiaphas, who was the chief priest, were trying to figure out how we could arrest him. The interesting thing is the Talmud in the Midrash looks like it has a wanted poster. It says it wants Jesus because he's doing things on behalf of the devil. And that is a religious accusation, not a civic accusation. But they want to be done with him. And maybe they think he's doing things of the devil. But maybe they also think he's making us look terrible. He keeps barking at us. He keeps accusing us. He keeps calling us names like a brood of viper. And he keeps pointing out all the things we do, like putting aside our wives just because we don't like them very much, not helping our mother and father and honoring them because we'd rather give our money somewhere else. He is pointing out their hypocrisies. And any group of people in power, they're going to fight against this. They're not wanting to be called out by someone, especially someone they look down on, some tradesman in the middle of nowhere land coming here to our fabulous city in Passover time when we have throngs of people coming to worship at the temple because it's a holiday. So Jerusalem would have been buzzing with a lot of people, a lot of commerce. You know, think about Christmas time when all the stores make all their monies and all the churches and charities make all their donation money for the year. It's a huge economic time. It is a huge gathering time. Now this guy is causing trouble right at the very time we're about to have a great season. They're ready to be done with him because they don't want him to be around anymore. So again, this is going to be two days away. And on Thursday night, he is handed over to be crucified. So that's about the timing that we're at. And they don't want to put Jesus to death at the feast because, again, so many people were there. Again, they said that they estimated twenty to 50,000 people were there in Jerusalem at the time. That's a big range but that several hundred thousand others would come at this time. And if we put Jesus out now, this could cause riots. This could cause everything we don't want to have. And of course, they're worried on the other side, you know, that if they don't do something and this goes into riot or they do it at the wrong time, now we're going to get a Roman crackdown because we have not been able to keep the peace. You know, again, it was this truce between the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, and the Roman Empire. You keep things under wraps, and we won't have to crack down on you. So Jesus is in Bethany, and again, it's about two miles away. And this is in the house, they say, of Simon the leper. This was someone that Jesus healed. And a woman came up. He, the woman is Mary. Um, that was from Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' family that gets named in other Gospels. When we do the other Gospels, we'll hear more details, because each writer of the Gospels had a different take on the same events. They had a different point of view. Maybe they were in the different parts of the field or on the other side of the mountain, but they each had their own idea of the story. Matthew, again, is about lessons. And again, the woman Mary comes. She takes very expensive oil. The oil is called nard, pours it on the head of Jesus as he reclines in the table. Very expensive. And it says that the disciples we're indignant. Why waste all this money? We could sell this and give the money to the poor. Primarily, this is, in other stories, Judas. Judas is the treasurer. He's the guy who's worried about money. And he's saying, look, we could do a lot of good things with this money. Why are we wasting it? Do we think that Judas really cared about giving to the poor? I mean, obviously, we don't know, but we get pointed out that he doesn't. And he said, she's preparing for my burial. First of all, oil was used to anoint a king. 
we will see that when we get to King David and other kings in the Old Testament. So one hand, it is anointing him for kingship. And on the other hand, it's anointing him for his burial. Some of the commentary said that you get the idea that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were very wealthy people. And we go to their house a number of times and see them each in different circumstances. It's a place where Jesus and the apostles go many times. In the jar was alabaster, so a very expensive material. You know, this was an expensive jar. And they say that nard is a plant that grows in India. So it was an import. It is someplace that comes afar away. And of course, travel wasn't very easy then. So we know, again, this was very expensive. Now it says that one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I turn him over to you? I know what he looks like. And so they offered to pay him 30 pieces of silver. There's a lot of places in the Bible where 30 pieces of silver are mentioned, and it's, I think, never typically good. So he took that opportunity to betray him. It's interesting because when you read about Judas, you wonder, why did he do this? He saw all the things the apostles saw. He had the Holy Spirit with him at times. And some people say, well, you know, Iscariot means that he was either a zealot or he was a man from Kariot, which is a town in Judah, Kariot Hezron, also known as Hazor. And it's a southernmost city in Judah near the Negev Desert. So it is not terribly far. and, And it's part of where people think of as Edom. He was the only one who was not a Galilean. It's interesting because we see that at the beginning, right? They seem to all know each other as fellow fishermen initially. And so did he betray him because he just wasn't like the rest of him? I mean, I find that a little weird that Jesus is about to say, bring the whole world to me, but he wouldn't mean Southern Israel. I don't believe that Judas betrayed Jesus because he wasn't one of the Galilean groups. You know, that seems a little weird. Some people said that he was greedy. And after watching Jesus waste this valuable resource, he got mad and figured, well, I'm going to find out how I'm going to get money another way. It's indicated that Judas was greedy. But I also wonder, and I read this somewhere, and like I said, we can't know the intentions. It's not written down. We don't know anything. But did Judas even believe the Romans could do anything to Jesus? If he really believed that Jesus was God, that Jesus could do anything, and he's the Messiah, Let's bring this to a confrontation because we know that if we just push Jesus a little towards the edge, the Romans come after him, maybe Jesus will end the Roman Empire or maybe the Roman Empire can't touch him and we will get that 30 pieces of silver. It's just an interesting point, but we will never know on this planet why Judas did what he did, but he did. So then the Passover happens. And again, the Passover remembers the time when the angel of death passed over the children of Israel in Egypt, like the Egyptians were. This was a sign. This is a protected human being of God. And what was painted on the door to protect the people inside was lamb's blood. All of this is pointing all the way through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, that we're going to get the ultimate lamb of God that's going to do more than just pass over our doors, but save us all from whatever sins we've committed so that we can enter the kingdom of heaven. Because we're not perfect. We never can be perfect. And Jesus' method of saving us is about to come to a head. Long time ago, I did a Passover Savior with my church to point out all the different ways Passover, and it was one of my favorite holidays, primarily because it had questions that children were to ask the adults. And I love that. You can guess I was a little talker back then, too. But all the different ways that Passover points to Jesus, and there's some very obvious ones. Who's the lamb that's going to be slain at this Passover? It's going to be Jesus at this point. So he says, you know, my time is at hand. I'm going to have Passover at your house. And so I went to the building they think it was where Jesus had his final meal. And it's another beautiful rock building. And the room is big enough in there to have everybody in a long table. And so they were able to go into this place and have that final Passover inside of Jerusalem. And he says, you know, one of you is going to betray me. And they're, no, you know, they said that they were sorrowful. And he says, you know, whoever dips his 
hand in this dish with me will betray me because it is written, you know, and so it's more of the prophecy. And it says that Judas says, hey, is it me? And Jesus says, I have said so. He is going to tell him it is already betrayed. Now, here's going to be an interesting point. There's actually going to be two apostles that are going to betray him with different results. So he broke the bread and blessed it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body. And then he took the cup of wine and said, after he gave thanks, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you that I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. This is the end. And he's telling them. And this is the institution of communion. There are remembrances that this is his blood poured out for us. Just like in animal sacrifice, blood was poured out. This is the ultimate sacrifice. Again, Jesus is the Lamb of God and his blood will be poured out. The big debate in all of this comes in where Jesus says, this is my body. This is an ESV. It's many translation. Is it the body and is it the blood or is it like my body and like my blood? That's really where a lot of churches come down on communion and whether it is the true body and blood of Christ. And so poured out is, you can get the idea, like it said, poured out of like a container. You have a jar of it and it is poured out to the ground. He is about to spill what valuable thing is in the container and is coming out of the container, which is obviously his body. Then he says, this, I mean, they must be all just reeling at this point. They sung a hymn and then they went out to the Mount of Olives and he said, you will all fall away from me and gave more prophecy about striking the shepherd and then the flock will be scattered, right? So you're a sheep in a field and then you see someone take out your shepherd and everyone runs for the hills. That's what's about to happen. He says that before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter's like, I am not doing that. Now remember, Peter's always impulsive. He always has courage. He does the bold things. He's the guy who stepped out on the water when Jesus called him to do so. He was always the first to also do the impulsive thing. You know, when he said, no, Jesus, we're not gonna let anyone take you down. He's not getting it. This has to happen for all of mankind to get saved. At every point where Jesus had the opportunity to not do this thing because the devil tempted him, because Peter's like, nope, we're not going to let this happen. You, you know, we could do a number of things that would prevent this from happening. But if we prevent this from happening, mankind is not saved. This is a plan from the beginning of time in Eden to happen, and it is about to happen right now. So they were in a place called Gethsemane, which is a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And someone points out, isn't that interesting that we have the beginning of mankind in the garden, and now we have the salvation of mankind in the garden. We always see that we return to the garden as the image of the promise of God, what God wants us to live in and what God wants us to dwell in gardens. I mean, obviously, he talks about the city. We're not getting there yet. But gardens is this image, and now here we are again. So he says, you know, all of you kind of sit here, and I'm going to go over there and pray. And so he takes Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him, James and John. These words are like sorrowful. It says, even unto death, watch with me, you know, be with me. And so he asked God, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. We talked about the cup. Don't make me drink it. Let it go from me. Because even Jesus in his human form, he is every experience that we have and we would be scared. And so then he looks and he sees the disciples are all sleeping. And so he says, couldn't you just even watch with me for an hour? You know, please watch and pray so that you don't get tempted. This is a very famous quote from Jesus. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. We hope to do the thing we want to do. We want to do the things that God asks us to do. And we don't because the flesh is weak. And so for a second time, he goes out and pray. And he asks again, if this can't pass me, your will be done. I mean, that's a bold statement. There are people out there who worry about the Lord's prayer because it says things. Forgive me as I forgive other people. Do you forgive other people? 
then it says your will be done. Is that what we really want? We'd rather see our will be done. And in this case, Jesus is saying, honestly, fine. If it can't go for me, I don't think he meant fine, but then your will be done. And then he comes back and they're sleeping again, says their eyes were heavy. And so he goes again to pray for a third time. And then the disciples came to him and he says, sleep and take rest later on. The hour is at hand. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us go see my betrayer at hand. This is it. So some interesting facts is that Gethsemane means olive oil press. So they would press again because this is the olive garden, the Mount of Olives. This is where all the olive is. It's valuable. The oil is valuable. Olives are valuable. And they would bring it you know, across the Kidron Valley, which is the deep, deep, steep valley between the Mount Olives and the Mount that Jerusalem is on. So now we are at the hand. So they said this is Maundy Thursday. This is the Thursday where Jesus is betrayed. And so Maundy is when, obviously, we have the dinner. We have the time of prayer on the mount. And Maundy means commandment. This is where Jesus gives his commandments to his followers. And it's interesting that they were falling asleep. And, you know, obviously, they're having big days. They, but they could see that Jesus was tormented. You know, it's obvious that he asked for the cup to be taken from him. He says, if it can't, may your will be done. And he understood what was about to happen. And there's going to be more descriptions about this in other gospels. But you could see in his face, you know, you can imagine that in his face and every part of him, this was about to go badly. And the apostles can't stay away. Judas comes up and says, hey, and he has a crowd of people with them with swords and clubs. And they're from the chief priest and the elders. So this is going to be the temple establishment. And Judas kissed him, which he told, hey, the person I kissed, that's Jesus. You know, maybe they didn't all know who Jesus was, all the people with the clubs and the swords. So he was identifying Jesus. And Jesus knows, he says, friend, do what you came to do. And so then all the people come up on him. They seize Jesus, meaning they grab him from each side. And this is where it says one of the apostles draws his sword. We find out in other gospels it was Peter, because of course it was, and slices off the ear of a servant of the high priest. I mean, it's not a soldier. And someone said that because this was going for his head, he didn't like slice him in the leg or hit him on the arm. This was a headshot. He was going to kill this guy. And at this point, you know, he missed and he got the ear. And he's like, yeah, put your sword down. I wanted to call 12 legions of angels and a legion was 6,000. I could do that. But then the scripture won't be fulfilled. We have to do this because all of scripture is going to be fulfilled right now. And then Jesus said to the crowd, have you come against me like I'm some sort of a robber? I mean, do you think I'm a common criminal with swords and clubs? I mean, this is going to be just a dude who didn't have anything on him. And he goes, I sat in the temple with you. I did all these things. You never took me then. But you know what? This all has to take place. So scripture is fulfilled. And then it said the disciples left him and fled. They all ran. Oh, boy. This is not a good thing for the disciples. This is not them being bold. This is not them standing up for Jesus. And the other part of it is this is not them understanding this had to happen that this was part of the prophecy, that these things were all the things that he'd been saying all along. He's been telling them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. They're going to come for me. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to be in the earth for three days. You know, he's been telling them all along and none of this happens. And you may think they may be getting it now, but instead they run off because they're scared. And so an interesting point that Father Mike Schmidt said on his Bible podcast was, that Jesus at that point saved two people when, it doesn't mention in this place, when Jesus heals the servant. He saves the servant and heals him. That's not how he's going out and he's not meaning to go out with violence. But he also saves Peter. Peter would always be in trouble, looking over his shoulder, waiting to be arrested. 
also having the guilt of doing this to another human being. Jesus undid a wrong, and that means that he saved Peter from a future that he did not want Peter to have. Someone asked the interesting point, too, about why is it that Matthew, Mark, and Luke does not identify the apostle that drew the sword. And they say that the only one that did was John. And that is because the Gospel of John was written after the death of all the other apostles. So it was possible they were sparing embarrassment to Peter by not mentioning his name. But John, after Peter was dead and the rest of them were dead, felt a little bit more free to identify which apostle it was that drew the sword. But I think knowing Peter, we probably could have guessed. Jesus talked about in his time that his ministry will bring the sword. He didn't mean it like this. He didn't mean it that we are going to hit people with swords. He means the swords are going to come for him, and they are right now. Seized him, they point out, in the middle of the night outside the city. Because again, we don't want to rile up all the people. We don't want to have this in broad daylight where everyone can see. Jesus goes before Caiaphas and the council, and this is where the, the scribes and the elders were all there. And Peter was kind of following at a distance. I kind of wonder if he was looking for an opportunity to save Jesus, get him out of this. I mean, he's still not getting the point of this, that this must happen. So I wonder if he's trying to figure out what can we do to save our rabbi? So now the priests and the whole council are there and they're looking for t false testimony. They're like you're going out to the audience. Did anyone see this guy do anything? And so this one guy goes and he says, oh, I, I saw him say that he was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, which is not what was said. He was talking about his body being destroyed and being rebuilt in three days, resurrection. And, you know, so this is trumped up charges. They're trying to get anyone, anything to see. Because if they had evidence, because we talked about in Small Steps with God, how the court system had almost like a, our court system, where there was one person who was the accuser and one person who was the defender, and then people heard both sides of the case. And you go in there with already charges set. Here, they're trying to invent the charges. Who, who saw this guy do something? Anyone see anything, you know, that you would testify against? I mean, this is not how court goes, right? This is a backwards trial where we're going to arrest you. We're going to create a bunch of charges against you. And we're going to get people to testify against you on stuff that's not even true. So they're saying, okay, well, he said he's going to take down the temple. That's blasphemy. You know, and now they're going to say he deserves death because of the things that he did. And so then they want to know, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming again the next time in clouds of heaven. <laughs> so then all the rabbis and high priests tore their robes, which we know oh, this is blasphemy. This is horrible. He deserves to die. And like someone smacks him and says, okay, Jesus, use your power of prophecy to tell you who smacked you. I mean, this is just getting insulting and horrible all the way around. So when Jesus was sitting outside this courtyard, kind of spying on what was happening to Jesus, a, a servant girl comes to him and says, hey, weren't you with all those people? He denies it to them. And then another man comes up and he's like, I don't even know what you mean. So then another servant girl saw him. So these are girls, little girls. And he says, I saw you with that Jesus. And then he denies it again with an oath. He swore an oath that he doesn't. I don't know him. And then another bystander comes up to him. He says, oh, I can totally tell you're with them. I mean, your accent betrays you. That's what it says in ESV, meaning you're one of those hicks in Galilee. I can tell by the way you talk. And only people coming in from Galilee are coming in with Jesus. So of course, you're one of them. And Peter says again, I don't know him. And then the rooster crows. And then Peter remembers the foretelling of him betraying Jesus. And he weeps bitterly. This is exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. And now he did it. Oh. So we have kind of two reactions to this. You know, that Judas betrays Jesus for the money. And now Peter, well, the rest of them too, they all ran. But Peter in particular denies him, denies him before man. And so now we see those two 
contrast coming out. We're going to see more of that coming up in the next chapter. So what I'm going to meditate about this particular passage is when we think about our reactions, when we think about things that happen to the church or things that happen to us or happen to our fellow church people, we can get the wrong reaction, anger, violence. And God calls us not to do those things. He calls us to defend people, to protect the innocent. That's where we can talk about other issues that we're not talking about now. But the idea of defense is one thing. The idea of attacking back when God calls us to peace, that when we know the sword is against us, it means it's coming against us not to bring swords so that we can club other people with it. What is our reaction sometimes to times of trouble? And is there another tactic we should be taking? My prayer in all of this is to pray for the right reactions on the attacks against church people, against the church itself. Is there a loving way that we can confront evil that happens against the church instead of our first reaction, which is always going to be that anger? Some people called it the curse of Cain, where anger and violence rises up in us. And what I want to share with other people is this concept of Passover, the different pieces that come together in Passover that indicates this bigger picture of redemption from the Lamb. And we're seeing it come to fulfillment right now in this Passover meal. But I want to tell other people, this is a plan that has been written from the first garden to now this garden. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to pray, to pray for me. I need your prayers and I'll pray for you too. You can ask me to pray if you want to do a secret email. I'll pray for you, but you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Please remember that in a topic unrelated to this podcast, a new podcast of mine is starting tomorrow. It is called Buzz, Blossom and Squeak. At one time, I called it Exploring Creation one step at a time or in small steps, but it is about nature, animals, weather, stars. The trailer is up now so you can subscribe and the first edition of the podcast is tomorrow. Thank you so much.